Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, raise your hand if this is the first time you've been to the UN campus in Hong Kong. First time here. Okay, we've got a few, few new people, a few new faces. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the uh, University of Chicago Francis and Rose UN uh, campus here in Hong Kong. Um, you're in the Hong Kong Jockey Club uh, academic complex on the UN campus. And uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time just welcoming you and uh, telling you a little bit about what we're doing here on campus before I turn it over to Professor Cagney. We're really delighted to host this event uh, this evening with Professor Kate Cagney on the UN campus. Um, but let me tell you like a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, uh, this is the first, if you, if you didn't know, this is the first actual campus that the University of Chicago has in Asia, um, which basically means that we offer degrees here. And um, you know, our academic presence in Asia started about 20 years ago in Singapore. And we moved uh, to Hong Kong about five years ago and opened this campus in November of 2018, um, not even a year ago. Um, what makes this different, again, we offer academic um, uh, degrees here. And, um, but we also have a, a center in Delhi and a center in Beijing. And those have been open both five and 10 years, respectively. And they're hubs for our faculty to do a lot of exchange work with their counterparts in India and China and to do advanced research in those geographies. So you can see that University of Chicago is making a significant commitment to the Asia Pacific region and we have an ever uh, growing presence here. Um, one thing I like to share because uh, our team on the Hong Kong campus developed this uh, uniquely for this campus and that is our mission statement for this campus is to be the gateway in Asia to enhance knowledge, inspire new thinking and enrich humanity. And that's really specific, um, specifically developed by our team. Um, we do that in a way that's very unique to the University of Chicago um, through open discourse and free exchange of ideas. And I'm sure Professor Cagney will uh, try to engage you in the conversation, which is such a Chicago way of doing things. Um, here in Hong Kong, while we provide a world-class executive MBA, at this location, we also provide executive education courses on a wide range of topics. Um, we have three to six cohorts of undergraduate study abroad uh, students uh, who visit Hong Kong from Chicago every year for between three and nine weeks um, per each cohort. Um, we have, um, as part of this program, this is a, called the a Ewan um, Speakers Program. Um, Francis and Rose Ewan have generously donated um, resources so that we could have uh, people like uh, Kate Cagney come and share her research uh, here. So that's a, that's a relatively new program. Um, Kate, I believe, is only the fourth professor who's come from Chicago to share her research, but we'll have many, many more people come um, and do much the same. So, um, and we have other events for uh, for-profit innovation and uh, entrepreneurship and social innovation that take place on this campus through the Polsky Center and the Rostandi Center. Uh, we have some of our staff members, Francis and uh, Priscilla sitting in the back, several of our staff members who are engaged in those activities. If you have any questions about them, feel free to ask. Uh, but we're just getting started. So um, tonight we're delighted to have a very special UN scholar, Professor Kay Cagney from the University of Chicago Sociology Department talk about social capital and community. Uh, professor Cagney is professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago and the Director of Population Research Center, NORC, and the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Cagney's work examines social uh, inequality and its relationship to health with a focus on neighborhood, race, aging, and the life course. Professor Cagney has developed a series of research papers on neighborhood social capital and its relationship to outcomes such as self-rated health, asthma prevalence, physical activity, and mortality during the 1995 Chicago heat wave. She also focuses on the validity of such measures and the development of new neighborhood-based metrics that reflect the perceptions and experiences of older residents. Currently, Professor Cagney works on two Chicago-based studies of neighborhood context 
and older adult health and is examining the role of social and physical environment in older adult well-being with the National Social Life Health and Aging Project. Through the course of Professor Cagney's career, her research has answered many questions, and I just wanted to share a few of you, a few of them with you tonight. Uh, one question, what role does race play in neighborhoods? And what effect does it have on mo mobility later in life? Another question, what impact does a major weather event have on a community's ability to bounce back from catastrophe? I pulled a couple of these because I thought they were very specific to Hong Kong, and that one specific to typhoons. As a spin-off on questions like, do you know where your child is? Professor Cagney has also posed the question, do you know where your seniors are? And with that, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Kate Cagney. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK. Is that coming through? Thank you so much. Thank you to Marty. That was a very generous introduction. I've been, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so I wanted to thank Mark for his hospitality, um, Francis for spending so much time with me in these last few days, many meetings as I'm um, exploring collaborations. Um, my, now I'm kind of coming in and out a little bit, but as long as I'm clear to you, that's fine. Um, and wanted to thank Kate Moore for setting up my meetings, and I'm thrilled to be part of this Visiting Scholars program. And I hope today what, what we'll have is really more of a conversation. Feels like a classroom setting, right? So I invite you to ask questions. Also, you know, I'm from the University of Chicago where people often would take issue with my title slide and want to debate it. <laughs> so um, in that spirit, I encourage you to jump in and discuss and debate. Uh, and then I know we'll have a little time for questions at the end, too. Um, I'm going to begin with two images. So that, you know, is my title. This is a collection. So, so I have two images that, that symbolize recent travel. This is a collection of men socializing in Italy. Um, and I share it because I'm really interested in what makes people come together, what makes people go outside, what makes people spend time together and socialize. And I want to understand what entices right, that kind of behavior, and I want to be able to predict it. So here's another image. This is, this is from Hong Kong. And this is a formal interaction, right? People are getting together to exercise or doing Tai Chi. And again, what is it that makes the collective operate? What motivates it? What maintains it? What makes it um, operate in this particular generation, but what's transmitted to subsequent generations? So those are the kinds of things that I want to talk about today. And I want to focus on place. And so I'm going to ask the question, what is place? Um, and I'm interested in your insights on that. And then I want to ask, what might it mean to take a place-informed approach to research in aging, health, population sciences? Why is place important at all? Why do we care about neighborhoods? Why do we, we identify with particular neighborhoods? Why do we identify with particular states and countries? How do demographic characteristics shape interactions in place? You know, how do they facilitate interaction? How do they might potentially impede it? And then how might place affect well-being? So we're really going to have this frame of place. I'm sharing this you know, for those who are interested in thinking about the demography of aging. This is some recent work with Aaron York Cornwell. I really want to think about what is it about communities? And what is it that actually makes older adults feel more welcome, feel like they have a place where they can maintain and engage in social behavior? Um, and how is it that they can stave off some of the kinds of functional impairments or recover from illness and maintain independence? OK, so with that overview, I want to ask, why is age important? We can think about the demography of aging. And, I, and someone told me, is this true, right? Um, Hong Kong now has the longest life expectancy. Is that right? So we want to understand why that's the case. Um, we want to understand how that might vary by gender and by social class, right? We want to bring the tools of social science to understand a phenomenon like that. But, but demography is important to all of us, right? We have an aging population. We want to think about the health and policy consequences. But one of the things that, that made me excited about research in aging is that I had fundamental interest in inequality. And I had a professor at Johns Hopkins University, Tom Leviste, 
who said to me, if you're, really, if you're interested in inequality, aging is where it's at. <laughs> because it is the manifestation of inequality. It is inequality that accrues over time. Timing and sequencing of life events, thinking again about the accumulation of exposures. And, and really, in later life, it is where these forms of inequality manifest themselves. And so that's one of the reasons why I think aging is such a fascinating prism to understand social life. So what is place? I began really with this notion, and I'm going to spend most of my time tonight talking about conceptions of place, how we measure it, how we theorize, and then how we might implement studies that help us understand the influence of place. So we can think of place as something, of course, that's municipal, a city, a county, a state. But we can also think of categories, urban, suburban, rural. We kind of generally have a sense of how these might come together and how they differentiate. We think a lot about residential space. And what I'll ask you to do today is to think beyond residential space and think about all the kinds of places that might be influential to you. And to think more about exposure space than to think about being tethered to a particular residential location. But we also want to think about place as a social space, right? We want to think about public and private space, indoor or outdoor space, institutional contexts, and again, how they might bring people together in space. And we want to think about the ways that um, all those spaces are nested or overlapping. That has some really interesting uh, statistical applications, which we probably won't talk about a lot today. <laughs> but for anyone who's a fan of hierarchical linear modeling, um, that helps us really sort out the variation that comes at these different levels. Right? Like we might think about a school nested in a neighborhood that's nested in a county. How do you understand that statistically? And my, my colleague, Steve Roddenbush, is one of the people who helped us develop those models that are so helpful to us analytically. So why is place important? Why do I care so much about situating vulnerable populations, particularly older adults, in place? And as we know, right, place matters a lot for resource allocation. We can think about health services. And here there's some evidence that suggests that the closer you are to a particular health service, right, the longer you live, right, the better your care. Um, but there's also a social safety net, and that may vary by place. Um, resource availability matters a lot, both formal and informal. Um, but I also like to think about opportunity structures in place. So um, you know, there's a lot of research in social networks that suggests that um, you know, what we might consider weak ties. Um, has anyone heard of the notion of weak ties? Granovetter? We're going to talk about, oh, yay, <laughs> thank you. Um, we're going to talk a lot about these sociological terms. In it. Um, but what's important about it is that you know, it's sort of the networks of networks. Um, if I want to get a job, um, I might turn to Francis for a job, but it's actually Francis's cousin who helps me get that job. And there's a lot of evidence that these sort of weak ties that come through these distal networks end up being really consequential in our lives. Um, so I want to understand how those might be important and how they overlap with where we spend time, with the places we inhabit. Also, of course, place you know, gives us a sense of belonging or connectedness. During my visit, many people identified with the neighborhoods where they lived and described in, quite, in a lot of detail why that particular place was preferable. Um, and again, what I really want to get back to is this notion, not necessarily where we live, but the places we're exposed to. So what I want to bring together, so I've been talking about place and talking a little bit about aging, and I want to bring those two things together. So I want to think about that at the individual level, so aging in place. Um, in the conversations I've had over the last few days, I'm learning a lot about public housing and social housing and the different sorts of places where older adults may reside. Um, and I want to think about the embeddedness of that. But I also want to think about age at a contextual level. I want to think about age structure. Um, you know, Hong Kong has right an age structure that we might suggest has a long right tail, right? It's thick on the more aged end. We want to understand how why that matters, how that has implications for the built social environment. But I'm also really interested, I won't talk about this as much today, I'm going to talk a little bit about segregation by race. But you know, at least in the Chicago context, and that will be our, our case study here, we see neighborhoods that are you know, increasingly differentiated by race, by class, by age. And we want to understand the determinants of that. And that's one motivation behind this study that I'll discuss. 
So, you know, what is it that helps us provide a framework for the kind of study that I would like to engage in? And this is, of course, part of my title, and it is this notion of social capital and community. How many of you are familiar with the term social capital? A lot of you, right? One of the things that's interesting about social capital is I think that it, um, it has kind of permeated our, you know, our more sort of common dialogue about the way we think about coming together and the kind of, and we think about it in general terms as something that has a positive valence, right? If you have a lot of social capital, that's good. You have a reservoir to draw on on time and need. And I just want to share a general definition. Social capital refers to features, networks, we've already talked about that, social norms, I'm going to spend a lot of time in conversation about that today, social trust that facilitate coordination, mutual benefit, this kind of stock of civic virtues. Anybody read the book Bowling Alone? Right, Robert Putnam's book, he's a political scientist. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> You're reading, we're reading all the same things. Um, but it's this idea, you know, ha have those kinds of um, normative arrangements like bowling, have, right, have they kind of gone by the wayside and what does that mean for community? Um, you know, I might, sort of, I might share a more formal definition. James Coleman was a colleague at the University of Chicago, and he really defined it as a structural pop property of relationships, strong ties that shape social norms. One of the things that always helps me think about social capital is that it's non-divisible. So we have social capital in this room right now, but you don't walk out with it. Right? It exists, it's an emergent property. It exists because we are here in this collective space. So it is not something you carry with you, it is created by the community. And I think this illustrates the importance of social capital. And one thing that Coleman did was also link it to human capital. Since we are here in a, you know, a component of the business school, I feel compelled to mention Gary Becker, right? who had an appointment in the business school, who is the one who theorized about human capital. And he and Jim Coleman would be in workshops together, talking about the distinctions between human capital, the stock of virtues you carry with you, and social capital, those that you are embedded in, and how they interact and how they are influential across social groups. So that's an, you know, a nice University of Chicago moment. Um, and I'm going to now spend, so I told you why I, that social capital provides a frame for the kind of study that I want to engage in, which is this intersection of aging in place. And I'm going to give you two illustrative examples um, of how I became so interested. Do you need me? No. <laughs> how I became so interested in how, um, how social capital functions. So this comes from Rob Sampson's work in a book called Great American City. And I'm going to let you do your thing. No, that's fine. Um, and this is a depiction of something called a letter drop. And it's looking at the rate that letters are put in a mailbox and the extent to which bypassers engage in CPR. So this is, is the city of Chicago. How many of you have been to Chicago? So a lot of you know the city. These are the 77 community areas that comprise the city. I'm going to show you some other analyses of the city. Those are good. I'm going to break those down into 343 community areas, in part motivated by Rob Sampson's work. But what this shows um, is the extent to which people engage in behavior that is pro-social and that is not exchange-based. So this is where I think sociologists differ a bit from economists in the way they think about conceiving of social interaction, this is meant to tap something called collective efficacy. In short, that's the ability of the community to come together for the common good. I'm going to talk more about how that definition emerged. But why the letter drop, I think, is such a great experiment is that um, researchers in Chicago and their graduate students went around and randomly dropped um, letters that had a postage stamp on them in various Chicago neighborhoods. And then they looked at the differential rate at which those were picked up and put in a mailbox. Isn't that a great idea? <laughs> I wish I thought of it myself. Um, and it's so great because, again, it's not like you pick up my mail, I pick up yours. You feed my cat, I feed yours. It is something that you, you bend down and you pick up that letter and you put it in a mailbox because that's what we do for one another. That's the community. We look out for one another. So there's no way in which you get credit for this kind of behavior. Again, it's a normative orientation. And so you'll see, so this is a, you know, clearly a graphical depiction, but you'll see that 
there appears to be a correlation between who picks up an envelope and puts it in the mailbox and who engages in CPR in these communities. One of the other things that's really important to remember, and I don't have a map of economic status today, but I think um, one really nice contribution of the set of studies that Rob Sampson did is to show that these things are not necessarily correlated with income. And we think about income as being a really important resource, and certainly it is, aggregate income levels in neighborhoods, but that these kinds of phenomena stand apart from the economic status of the community. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one more motivation gets me into activity space. And since you mentioned the Chicago heat wave, I thought I would talk about this for just a second. Um, my colleague, Chris Browning, who's at Ohio State University, we both read this book. I don't know if anyone else has had an opportunity to read it, but it describes the Chicago heat wave in 1995. One of the reasons it was a compelling story, unfortunately, is that many people died in the short course of about 10 days. Um, and as you can see, when you might expect about 72 people to die, 365 people died in a day. And they were mostly older adults. This is an ethnographic account, and what Chris and I wanted to do was to look at the larger city and to try to understand what structural features might contribute to these deaths. The story that's told in the book is one of mostly social isolation. And so we wanted to dig in a little deeper and compare these neighborhoods. So this is excess mortality for Chicago neighborhoods during those, um, those days. Um, and what do you see? some patterns, some clustering, right? And I should point out the white is low, right? And the red is high. Right, you see some clustering. And then this, remember I told you about the principle of collective efficacy? That's what this looks like. So there's a bit of a correlation there. This is health-related collective efficacy for Chicago neighborhoods. So in the neighborhoods where um, people were more likely to perish. There were lower levels of this connectedness that I describe. But here's what's really interesting, we think. And this kind of informs where we're going next in our conversation. What we then did, we used something called a systematic social observation. And this is something that Rob Sampson and colleagues did, where they threw a lot of University of Chicago graduate students in a minivan and had them videotape every face block in the city of Chicago. And what that told you was um, something about physical and social disorder in communities. It also told you about the extent to which there were businesses available to residents and whether or not the street was animated. What we found in our study was that mortality increased when the level of commercial embeddedness declined. And it's kind of a, we were, we both did this when we were junior faculty. We were like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real finding, that it had this step function. And so one of the things we think is true here is that something like a commercial space creates a necessary but not sufficient condition for the kinds of social interaction that we care about, the kind that is protective when somebody has a heart attack in the street and somebody feels compelled right, to provide CPR, or the kind that makes a difference for whether or not kids get asthma or older adults have functional decline. So we think, and, and I'm gonna to get to some old um, Jane Jacobs work in a moment, that the extent to which a neighborhood provides the kind of infrastructure that allows for social engagement is protective against mortality. So those are kind of my two motivating examples for where we will go next. And we wanna think about the study of place. I wanted to just Say so there are lots of ways we could go. We could use frames from psychology, economics, anthropology, architecture. I spent some really nice time during my visit here with sets of architects, with people from schools of social work, um, with those who are motivated by research and geography. And so you'll hear tenets from those kinds of disciplines in our discussion today, but I'm really gonna focus on the sociological and think again about this notion of social cohesion, in part motivated by those two examples that I just provided to you. That there's something tangible in these neighborhoods that is not about physical infrastructure or economic status that matters for people's well-being and longevity. So here's my example. I'm gonna take a sociological approach to understanding the impact of place. 
So one of the things that we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you a little Chicago School sociology, because I have to, because you can report back to the powers of V that I shared, right, our story on the road. Um, but there's, there's some limitations to that kind of work because it is, again, um, contingent on residential location. And so it doesn't really get at your circumference of turf or the understanding of the microenvironment. And so our project asks of whether new methods can provide insight into how place is perceived, how it might matter, how it might be modified. And thankfully, I have some colleagues at the University of Chicago that share their knowledge about new technology that can really help us answer some long-standing questions in sociological work. So this is essentially the gist, and I've really already said this. Current approaches don't effectively assess exposure. And really, think about your life today. How long were you home today? <laughs> like 20 minutes. Um, yeah, sorry if I brought up something. That's, um, but you might have been, spent a lot of time in transportation. You spent a lot of time at work. I mean, thankfully, you chose to come out on Monday night, which I really appreciate. But, but in principle, yeah, you're not completely tethered to your residential location. So, you know, at least in the US context, we use these arbitrary census-based measures to make assessments of where people live. And so, for instance, um, from my census tract, I would carry the aggregate level of economic status, educational attainment, um, you know, maybe like the you know, age of buildings. We can think of lots of other things. Age structure, ethnic heterogeneity, lots of measures in the aggregate that you would assign to me because of my census tract. But I think we can ask the fundamental question of whether that's reasonable. Census tracts technically, again, you know, it, at least in the US, are not neighborhoods. And so in some sense, there's already error embedded in the way that we're assessing that. But again, if we're interested in a notion like exposure, which we often are if we're thinking about something like a health event, then we want to know where people spend time. We really want to understand where they go and how they feel when they're there. Um, so, you know, essentially saying that theoretical approaches are largely, right, neglecting these spatial exposures. And I'm going to talk a little bit about social disorganization theory and something called a social ecological approach. Okay, this is the last book I'll ask about. Has anybody read Death and Life of Great American Cities? I talked about this in one meeting from the 60s. Change. Jane Jacobs, right. So Jane Jacobs, for those of you who spent any time in New York City, saved the West Village. She was an architecture critic, community organizer. She also wrote some really great social theory that's been very influential in sociological discourse across institutions. And we draw on Jane Jacobs' theory to help us modify social disorganization theory, which comes out of the University of Chicago, to understand how an animated street might matter for the health and well-being of older adults. Um, it helps us, again, understand the circumference of turf principle and the neighborhoods and networks that may be consequential. You know, and the other thing that I think is just so interesting, this came up in our meeting today, um, but this idea that, you know, we, um, we presume that people's lives constrict as they age. There's often a dialogue. Sometimes I'll ask in a room how many people think, right, and I could ask you, that lives constrict as we age. And, right, I mean, I sort of set this up, but, but, you know, we have no data to suggest that, as far as I can tell. Maybe you might know of research that would tell us that, but we actually don't have anything that suggests that lives become more homogenous as we get older. In fact, there's really data to suggest that lives differentiate as we get older, and that people retire, may take up a second job, they may engage in caregiving of a family member or a child, um, they may take up a particular passion that takes them far away from their residential location. And so I think we need to be mindful that um, there are many things to learn about understanding the pathways that older adults engage in in later life. OK, so here's a little bit of theory. This, um, uh, is old Chicago school theory where we think about neighborhood structure and how it might affect neighborhood or individual outcomes. So Sean McKay, Burgess, and others suggested that there are structural features of communities like ethnic heterogeneity, age structure, economic status, 
um, that were related to a particular outcome through a social process. And that social process could be social network density. It could be this notion of collective efficacy I told you about. Um, but th that's the glue that links these neighborhood structural processes to a particular kind of outcome. So this comes from the book The City and these ecological models where we almost think about the city as an organism, right? Um, and that there's sort of a web of public trust that gets back to Jane Jacobs in a moment, but this idea that there is something sort of amorphous that, that is living, breathing, um, and that brings all of these components together. But one frustration we have is that, so we're looking at this particular neighborhood structure, and colleagues like Luke Anslin have helped us think about how, we, how this focal neighborhood might be influenced by the neighborhoods that are adjacent to us. Um, and so we can try to understand something like spillover effects. So there are statistical models to help us understand that. But what do we do about that neighborhood? That neighborhood that's way far away, that has very different characteristics, that ends up being very influential to you. How do we incorporate that into the model? And I'll just give, um, I have a graduate student who's working in New York right now, and I'll give a shout out to her work. And she, um, she was collecting data in New York City, and she had people draw their neighborhoods and then draw where their house was. So about half the people put their house here and drew the neighborhood around it. And another 25% put it in some quadrant. The house was here, 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 and the neighborhood is around it. Fully 25% put the house here and the neighborhood over here. Right? So identified with a very different space that was not residential. So that's curious, right? And we want to understand what it is that might motivate people to right, character, characterize their lives in that way. OK, we have to give right Jane Jacobs her due. Um, she has a skeptical look on her face because she is in front of Le Corbusier kinds of buildings, tall buildings, which uh, is, th this is a familiar form of social structure here. And she felt that some forms of taller buildings were not great for the social capital right, that we might like to form. Because there are fewer units on every building, um, in, on every floor, excuse me, in these buildings. And so you don't get as much sight line on people. You don't see people sitting on a curb, right, watching people go in and out of the neighborhood. The idea of eyes on the street, is that a familiar term to any of you here? It's kind of a notion that. Um, Jane Jacobs popularized, but it's this idea that people engage in informal monitoring and they know who belongs and who doesn't. Um, so she's really helped us enhance this model. And we won't go over this in detail, but remember I told you these are structural features, those are in blue, that really comes from old Chicago school work. And then this idea of overlapping routines, the web of public trust, the idea of social cohesion and informal social control, that's what that letter drop was in part meant to measure. All of those are connected to an outcome like health. So it all comes together to talk about something called activity space. So I'm going to show you some key results from our data collection effort. We have three waves of data. I'm going to show you data from wave one. And what we hope to do with this project is to really understand the dynamic nature of older adults in urban space. So activity space, this is a definition, but you probably could have come up with this on your own. The set of places individuals come into contact with as a result of their routine activities. This is our large and committed research team from the University of Chicago, Ohio State, uh, UCLA, and Harvard who are giving us advice on the structure of this grant and to give a nod to NIA for supporting us in this effort. I share today that this grant um, I submitted four times before it was funded. I feel that that should motivate the more junior people in this room to never give up. Um, and I'm yeah, happily uh, able to share data from that effort. Um, OK, so uh, I'll just quickly say, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I just want to say that one of the things that's exciting about this project, it brings together the biological and the social. Um, we do a, a large-scale social survey. We have interviewers from the National Opinion Research Center, 450 respondents. We follow them for a week at a time over three intervals. We get biological measures. Um, so we take their blood. Um, we ask them about their neighborhood social environment. We're taking their blood. We hand them a phone. They carry this phone for a week at a time, and we track them. Five times a day for each of those seven days, they answer brief questionnaires. Those are 
Those are called ecological momentary assessment techniques. Um, it comes from the work of Csikszentmihalyi, who is a psychologist who came up with the notion of flow. But the, the short shrift on it is that instead of asking you, for instance, in the last week, did you feel sad? We ask you in the moment, are you sad? So there is evidence to suggest that we're better at responding to questions, particularly about mood or pain or things that might be um, you know, transitional in context, that we're more effective in reporting those when asked in the moment rather than a retrospective assessment. So we went with this method. Um, one of the reasons this was so difficult to fund is that many people felt that this would not be possible to do with an older adult population, both in the management of the phone and in the implementation of the EMA. So I'm happy to report that we have data. <laughs> so, and that, yes, is a miracle. Um, just to familiarize you a bit with the neighborhoods we draw data from, there are 10 neighborhoods. These were purposefully chosen to vary by race and social class in the city of Chicago. Many of you may know uh, Chicago is a very segregated city. Uh, African Americans live primarily on the south side. White, re white residents live primarily on the north side. And the west and part of the south side are large Latino populations. Um, Chicago is divided, but approximately one-third white of European ancestry, one-third African-American, and one-third Latino, primarily of Mexican origin. Just to give you a sense, um, and the dotted lines are our select neighborhoods. One of the things I wanted to tell you, um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna look at some screens in a moment to see what older adults were faced with when they would get beeped. And so um, we did a focus group to understand how this worked. And we wanted to understand, you know, did people always fill these out the way they're supposed to? And did they feel comfortable with it? So one of our respondents said, one of the funniest things is that I was at church when it was pinged, but I had actually left it at home. So I got home. And I rang and I thought, I wasn't at home, I was at church. And I'd been at home a lot when it rang, when she got these pings. So she got back in her car and she drove to church to fill the thing out. <laughs> so, so part of this is to illustrate that's interesting. And one of the things we learned in the focus groups is that people didn't really want to share with us that they were alone, that there was a certain stigma with that, which motivated her to get in the car. The other thing it told us is that it's really important to engage in interviewer training and making sure that the interviewers really convey to the respondents that it's so critical that they answer these exactly when they're pinged and reveal exactly what they're doing. Um, and so some of this is the art of data collection. NORC is a wonderful research firm, and they helped us navigate this. But, um, but it is also to suggest that there are right, significant challenges in this sort of implementation. OK, so I'm going to show you some screens here. This is what the screen looked like when people were pinged. What language? Right? We want to make sure we're in English and Spanish. Um, where were you? We spent a lot of time making sure that we had every kind of context people would find themselves in, indoors or outdoors. Who were you with? About how many people were around? This is important in a moment because I'll show you some graphics related to that. Do you feel content? Do you feel energetic? Again, asking in the moment assessments of mood. We also wanted to get a sense of the interior environment for many people who might be physically isolated. We wanted to make certain that we characterized the environment that they were mostly embedded in. Um, and one of the things we did, we asked here if the home feels close-knit. This notion of close-knit is an idea that comes from collective efficacy theory. Is this neighborhood close-knit? So we wanted to kind of create a mini neighborhood in the household environment, so we tested these questions. And as a nod, again, to Samson and collective efficacy theory, we wanted to ask about the communities that people pass through. So this idea of disorder, of social cohesion, informal social control, we wanted to be able to apply that to the places you navigate. So those questions had only been asked about where people actually lived. But I think we all have a sense of the neighborhoods we walk through. And we can give you, kind of, you know, give a gut reaction of whether that feels like an inviting place or not. Um, and so we wanted to actually be able to measure that. Um, and we also measured some other things, too. We thought so often when we characterize communities, we think about um, how in some way they're not delivering something to us. So why not ask about things that have more of a positive valence? People of different ages, right? Pl places that feel dynamic. People are nodding and saying hello. We wanted to get some things that were on the other side of the spectrum. OK, so let's look at some results. 
Um, these are our 10 neighborhoods, and this tells us the number of unique people in all our social networks. We were again talking about social networks today and how people nominate right, someone in a social network. The question's often asked um, who you share important matters with, and people can nominate up to five respondents. Um, and so what's interesting here, and I hope you can see in the colors, is how different network density is by neighborhood. This is just descriptive data, but that's interesting, right? That some neighborhoods seem to have, the, the members of those neighborhoods seem to have more people in their social networks than others. We also see this vary by whether people trust. They, they're asked a normative question, just people in this neighborhood can be trusted. Same 10 neighborhoods. And you see really significant variation in whether people feel a level of trust in those communities. And I hope you can see this. These are our 10 neighborhoods. Can you see that? Not really. If you came over here, you could see it right there. That <laughs> looks great. OK, this is the best way to kind of think about this. Um, these are our 10 neighborhoods. And the little dots are places where people went during the course of a week. The little white squares. Are the, are the focal neighborhoods where we pulled sample. And the most important thing to, to get out of this slide is that people's pathways look pretty concentrated. But um, with an eye toward racial composition in the city, you'll see that neighborhoods like West Ridge and North Center, those are the neighborhoods that are primarily white. And everybody goes up into Wisconsin. For the neighborhoods that are primarily African American, like New City, like East Side, Englewood, Calumet Heights, people go a little bit west and they go south to Indiana. So in some sense, never the twain shall meet, right? One of the things we're finding in these data is that it looks like our, res our respondents are bypassing amenity-rich neighborhoods that are proximal to spend time in neighborhoods that have the same ra racial composition as the neighborhood of origin. But they're not, right? necessarily drawing from a rich set of amenities like those they just passed through. So we think that's a curious finding. We have much more to do analytically to try to understand that. But that does say something about our lives, potentially, that they are as segregated in our activity spaces as they are in our residential locations. OK, this is the call out. This one is a little hard to see, too. But what we did here is look at, we asked if people were fearful in the moment. These are folks, they live in Humboldt Park, they're outside. This is just an illustrative example. And they're here, low fear, medium fear, high fear. So there's some variation in the fear. And then they're telling us a lot about what their context is. Somebody's in a close-knit area, someone to help, yes. Are you alone? No. Number of people, three or four. Do you know all of them? Close-knit area, somewhat. Close-knit area, somewhat. Close-knit area, no. Some of these aren't, you know, these folks aren't so far from one another, right? So that might suggest there's variation in the microenvironment or variation in their perception. And I would underscore that perceptions are still so important to us. I'm going to turn to some big data opportunities in a moment, um, but that we still need to know how people feel and what they think. We can passively track them, but. Um, you know, sometimes people feel differently than their behavior suggests. And it's important to understand that concordance and discordance. So this is just to illustrate that we're getting a lot of variation with that EMA. Um, and this is just that these are other analyses. But what, one of the things we're also trying to do is to understand distinctions in um, physical activity and activity space and crime rates. So in this figure, um, crime in its incidents are in the red, and GPS density uh, is in black. And one of the things we're trying to do is sort out that it's a correlation. And we want to know whether, for instance, foot traffic and that density of activity is in some way productive against crime. That's where that hypothesis is going. So I said I was going to turn to big data in a moment. And I'll just spend the next five minutes, I think. Do I have five more? And talk a little bit <laughs> um, about the Array of Things project. Um, has anybody in the room heard about this? It'd be great to have Charlie Catlett come out. Charlie's the PI of this project. This is a great, I think, a University of Chicago story because Charlie's a computer scientist. I'm a sociologist. We have a psychologist and a physicist. Um, a lot of people from Argonne, a lot of people from the University of Chicago campus. It's truly an interdisciplinary um, project. And this is a node. It sits on a light pole. And it gets at wind, rain, street activity and the like. And I'm going to show you what it does in a second. 
Um, these are where you know, we have some of the locations. It's funded by NSF. Um, and it gets at this sweep of space. Um, I'll show you an image of this in a moment, but one of the great things about this collaboration, I was sharing this earlier today, is, is that um, Charlie asked me, what would you like? And I said, well, I really want to understand street activity. That's a fundamental question in sociological research. Is street activity protective against crime? Would it matter for health status, emotional well-being in neighborhoods? But no one has the data to really get at that. And so then he came back a few weeks later and he said, oh, we put in a camera for you. So you can get a street activity. And I thought he was kidding, but he wasn't. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that camera works. Um, this is what the node looks like. Um, it gets at UV, magnetic field, vibration, sound pressure, temperature, and then all of these kinds of um, uh, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and the like, as you can read. That's what it looks like on the inside. Uh, the camera, see that little bubble? there on that interior part, that's the camera that looks at clouds. There's a camera that looks at clouds and then a camera that looks at the streets. Because some of my Argonne colleagues care about cloud cover, <laughs> so we put in a camera for them too. Um, this is the image, this comes from the social life of small urban spaces. So this is something that William White did. He would actually videotape these face blocks and intersections to understand street activity. That was the motivation in part for what we wanted to understand. This is loosely what the images look like when they come into the um, node. They're analyzed in situ. So what it does is it doesn't transmit an image, but it tells us, are there, you know, are there adults? Are there kids in this park? Are there dogs? Are there baby carriages? One, another fundamental question in social science I would love to be able to answer is whether public space is sticky. Do people stay for a long period of time in public space, or do they just traverse? And so, something like this kind of innovation will allow us to address that question, at least to some degree. The great thing about working on this project with Charlie is that he knew that I was working on my activity space project. And we talked about how great it would be to have activity space data, where I'm following people and I have all the social survey data, and then to have environmental context data in which I could characterize where those people live, particulate matter, and the street activity. And so he said, well, you choose where you want nodes, and you can put them in the places where you drew sample, which is, again, I think, an extraordinary story of a project from NSF and a project from NIH coming together to bring unique data sources to some fundamental questions in social science. So we brought these together. And I'll just show you a few slides. This is nitrogen dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. These are the communities. These are the mean air quality. So you see that there's some variation. Um, in the city of Chicago, just to say that the EPA has three monitors in the city right now. And we will be putting up up to 500. So we will really have data on the microenvironment in a way that those monitors would never be able to capture. And so I'll just show you here, these are some of our respondents moving through space in that one week period of data collection. And you can see that they're moving in some very different spaces, some of which are quite noxious, right? And so what we're able then to do is to have information from their residential location on air quality and then air quality for the places that they go. So I'm really almost exactly on time, not bad. Um, I'm just going to close with some new directions, thinking about um, you know, how we might explore other forms of found or big data. I love using data from array of things. I also use census data. But again, I would only underscore that these are important coupled with social surveys that still query people about their perceptions and insights. Um, I become more and more interested in rural space. I'm from a rural area myself. Um, and I think in the US context, at least, we were caught off guard when we didn't have the data to characterize rural life, particularly after the last election. And so I think engaging in research that encompasses rural space is important. I also really want to engage in comparative research. It's one of the reasons I'm here and in conversation to think about ways that we could imagine some of these models in a context like Hong Kong. Um, and then this is something Francis actually brought up in our meeting earlier today, so I thought I should share. But how are we thinking about virtual places? In all of the conversation we've had, I haven't mentioned anything about social media or how it might matter. Um, 
you know, I guess I'm, I'm still sort of have the lens of, of interpersonal interaction is critical, um, but I think that we don't know the answer to that. We don't know how things also like Alexa can help us remember when to take medication or can remind us to call a kid. <laughs> you know, so I think there are ways in which technology can facilitate interpersonal interaction in a way that might be um, valuable to us. Um, and, I, and I think these methods are important for really understanding residential sorting, where and how we spend our time and our lives. Um, and I really want to understand the role of propinquity and why it matters. Um, and to think about that even in the context of intergenerational exchange. So I will close there. And I very much appreciate you coming. And I want to make sure, so these are the two studies that I discussed today, the Chicago Health and Activity Space in Real Time study, that's the activity space study, and array of things. Um, that's my email. <laughs> so if anyone, both of these data sources are available. Um, as I mentioned, array of things is a lot of data. So unless you have a mainframe, it's not something that's so easily accessible right now, but we're trying to think about ways to package those data so that community groups could use them to characterize their micro environments. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to the Visiting Scholars Program and to you, Chicago Global, for um, allowing me to share this with you. Thank you. Anyone have questions? Thank you for coming. Have you uh, applied this analysis to gated communities in the US? No. So I think that's a great question. Um, gated communities are, are relatively rare, in at least in the city of Chicago, where this is um, spread. But, but there's, a, there's a functional reason. Gated communities are really hard to get into for interviewers, typically. There's a reason they're gated. Um, they would still be in our sample. Um, so I, I, will, I don't think anybody in this sample resides in a gated community, but, but it's possible. They would still be pulled. The people who typically aren't in the kind of sample um, that would be, you know, essentially stratified random sample would be people who would be in an institutional context, like a nursing home, which is its own kind of gated community. But I know that's not what you meant. I think it's a very interesting question about the normative orientation and the extent to which right, it's designed to close off that kind of animated activity that we imagine is pro-social. Good question. Thanks. I don't know if you, the Array of Things project is looking to incorporate any, any other aspects into the device, but um, yep. I work with this uh, PhD who's an expert in sound, and one of the things that we've talked about is the impact of sound on gathering places and especially with seniors. Yeah. So this does pick up sound right now. Um, there have been some questions about how um, precise it is. There have also been a lot of questions this summer about gunshots because it does pick those up. Um, and you know, as we said, these are open source data, so anyone can draw that information. Um, there are also police cameras, and they have their own right, processes. Um, but there have been inquiries about those data. Um, but it becomes really important also for things like um, uh, academic achievement for kids, and right when they're proximal, right? Which is kind of what you're, yeah, getting at. I'm curious as to whether your data or your research looked into the mobility, because different cities have different types of mobilities built into buildings and um, public space. Um, how has your research looked into those and whether that has impact the, um, the, the areas that uh, these seniors travel to? So do you mean um, transit more, or do you mean uh, you know sidewalks that are effective? I just want to make sure I understand what you mean by mobility. I, I think both. So whether it be sidewalk or even uh, access to transportation, if they have certain disability, it could be you know physical, it could be also hearing, you know different types of yeah disability. Yeah. So we know about individual level disability. We have we don't have a lot of data on 
um, supportive services for older adults. We could do a little bit with that. We could get, it's a great question. We could get some data from the area agencies on aging to look at where those programs have permeated by neighborhood. We do know things like how close they are to the L and if they're close to bus line, those things we can geocode. And we are doing some geocoding with the infrastructure. Um, but I think it is an important point that in order to draw people outside, they have to have a physical environment they can effectively navigate. One of the big challenges in Chicago, and, and we were attentive to seasonality in our data collection, you know, winter. <laughs> and winter is really, really awful. I like it here, <laughs> it's but you know, it's a very, because of the ice and the snow and other things, so it, apart from even those kinds of issues, like making sure you're in a place where people are shoveling the sidewalk ends up being critical to whether or not you can go outdoors. What are your thoughts on intergenerational learning spaces? Say more about like um, whether it's institutions, like I know that certain universities have intergenerational programs or just informal learning spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I would fully support those sorts of structures. I think um, it, it's, it reminds me of some work that Linda Freed um, did some years ago, who's now, she's the Dean of the School of Public Health at Columbia University, but she started something called, um, it's, it's, well, it has sort of a teaching component for older adults, Experience Core, and she places older adults in public schools for tutoring. So it's not, it's, it's in the spirit of what you meant, but it's kind of intergenerational transmission of information. And what she found was that there were a lot of people who were in this retirement space who had skills that they wanted to share. And kids, she was doing this in Baltimore initially, kids who were desperately in need of that kind of direction. And so she did that matchmaking. And that program has gone on for 20 years. I know of some other programs, like I think Cornell University has some on-site housing that then facilitates social interaction. Um, University of Chicago does not. But you should write to Bob Zimmer. Tell him your idea, because I like it. Uh, what is the correlation if, uh, for the community health care or uh, outreach health care so that those uh, professionals can go to the uh, elderly home? Is there any correlations over there? Because they no need to move out. I want to make sure, let me just say that back to you and see. So are you asking about the correlation between where people live and, and health services? Yes. All, okay. All the outreach services, they can go to the place. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in these neighborhoods, it really varies, and that's something else we're documenting in geocoding. Um, again, one other thing we talked about today is the extent to which on the south side of Chicago, there um, are maybe three nursing homes that serve that entire area, residential nursing homes. And so what happens if you think about a nursing home as a place to live and not a healthcare delivery system, people often want a nursing home that's proximal to where they lived before, where family members might be. So that's been a, an incredible challenge on the south side because if people need residential care, then they end up just being hospitalized a lot and extending hospital stays. The other thing that I think is really important is that it's very hard to get um, home health care, you know, professional home health care in home. And so um, that the infrastructure for that is not right, as readily available on the south side. And so that means that many people are engaging in informal care arrangements. Um, so there's definitely a correlation, um, but we don't have those data available yet to say anything more specific. Thank you, prof oh, sorry, go. Oh. Thank you, Professor Cackney. So I was just wondering um, if you did any collection related to family, such as geographic proximity, or um, sort of the relation to younger family members, because I recognize that some family members might live in a neighborhood in a different part of town, and so that could affect their transportation, um, or if I'm going to drive you to the grocery as well. Yeah, so we know for the network members, when they nominate the network members, we know how far away they live. Um, so we do know that. We don't know about all family members. But one of the things that we are excited about, we haven't analyzed these data yet, is because we have those EMAs, we're able to say when somebody's in a location, are they with a family member or are they in a family member's home? So one of the things, um, Kyle Crowder has done some work on segregation. Um, 
is really curious to understand when people are spending time in these other spaces, why, right? <laughs> what are they doing? And so we can make presumptions about why people are entering these communities, but we don't know whether it's for an institutional reason, an in uh, interpersonal reason, and the like. So we really, to some degree, be able to get at your question through the EMA responses. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, at, at, at the chart. It seems to me that um, um, the trend is um, on methodology wise is um, more emphasized on real time survey now. Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm concerned is um, would, would this, um, because of the real time survey, we make use of a lot of uh, electronic devices, the iPhone, something like that. Would this approach would actually you know, exclude some cohort, some people that that they that they do not use to, to this sort of um, equipment, and how how would you you know overcome the problem? No, that is a so there are two critical features I think um, that one need to be concerned about. That's the most important one to me, and so. We spent a lot of time in interviewer training, making sure that the trainers could train. Um, and we actually gave people iPhones rather than have them use their own phone to manage the issue that many people in this cohort did not own one. And we, um, we were then able to train them on that specific phone and then to watch them do EMAs. And then we had a hotline right, to people walking through the EMA. So it, it was a very intensive kind of data collection enterprise, different than any other one I've worked on before. I've worked on a lot of social services. This one's just a lot harder because it has so many forms of implementation. But I felt like we should try. But that is a, that's a significant issue. The other one that often gets raised is that, you know, do respondents modify their behavior in the course of a week because we're watching them? Um, I, you know, in the focus groups, we seemed not to get that sense that most people, our lives are pretty routinized, and so they're engaging in those things they engage in over the course of a week. It would be nice to have the cadence of a month or a longer time period, because maybe that's not quite enough to really understand the structure of people's lives. Um, so, so far, I'm not as concerned about the second one as I am about the first, but, but it does give me some pause. I noticed that you spent quite a bit of time talking about Definition of place. Yes. How about the definition of age? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> what are your ideas? <laughs> so, I will say, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about even who, you know, who we would want to follow. Um, we end up following people who are 65 plus for kind of conventional reasons of, you know, timing of retirement and things that suggest a turning point, at least in the U.S. context. I think, uh, you know, I, many years ago when I was writing my dissertation, I spent a lot of time on life course research and thinking about the timing and sequencing of life events. Um, I learned of this great work by Carolyn Bledsoe, who is an anthropologist at Northwestern, who she was following particular um, groups in southern and central Africa who didn't treat age as a chronological phenomenon. They treated age as a, as a threshold effect. You became a certain age when you married. You became a certain age when you had a kid. You became a certain age when your mother died. And so you, you ended up being in bins, if you will, rather than carrying a chronological age. I was always really intrigued by that work. I still put age in as a covariate, like lots of other <laughs> conventional quantitative social scientists. But tell me more about what you were thinking. Because I'm, I'm going to cite you in a paper. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, the, to, to me, the definition keeps changing. Because I mean, yeah. if I remember my grandfather, he put his shoes back in a cabinet at 65 and sat in front of the television. He was old. But I'm not sure it's quite the same thing. People actually don't retire at 65. They often, on average, retire a little bit earlier and can have a much longer life than they used to. Yeah. So as we often hear today, the, the today's you know, 60, what is it today's 40s. So how do, we, how do we define aging? Where does it start? I mean, that's not clear. Just like the word retirement is not clear anymore. Right. Now, well, and I think also, um, how we age um, 
uh, differ significantly by opportunity. Again, that's where I'm, that's why aging intrigues me so much because of this accumulation of opportunities or insults, if you will, and how that alters these particular pathways. So, um, you know, somebody's new 40 might be somebody else's new 70 in terms of, right, their health status by the time they arrived at that point. Um, but I do think you raise this, I mean, it's one reason why I think studying this turning point in life is so fascinating because people are, right, living 30 or 40 more years. And I know longevity is something that the center is quite interested in understanding. Um, how are people spending those years? Um, the grant school at the University of Chicago, which is our continuing education um, school is really focusing a lot of their programmatic efforts on a population they believe would like to engage in retraining at that life stage. So it's a great question. Thank you. If I may have, uh, uh, have the second turn. Um, you, you mentioned one, one of your research question talk about you know, where and how people spend their time and does the um, uh, labor effect and health. Um, in, in, your, in your finding, do you find there's a major difference between, you know, urban drivers in, in city, city center, for example, more high density, more compact urban form, and in the suburban, which is a low density townhouse sort of neighborhood? Are there any, any difference? You know, so I only have data on rural space right now. Um, but I am, Another thing I'm really curious about are suburban contexts because suburban and rural areas are aging in the United States at a much greater rate. And if you think about the suburbs, the suburbs are not a place that accommodate aging. And, you know, and I've, I've heard this, an architect told me this at a party, so I don't know, I don't have any citation for this, but made the argument that the attached garage um, was the most important kind of innovation that um, um, contributed to the dissolution of social connectedness. Um, so, you know, people drive into an attached garage and they go through the breezeway, they make no eye contact. And so if you imagine, again, older adults growing old in a space where you don't have those sorts of informal interactions, it could be even more consequential. Um, so I think doing comparative work of that form is essential, and I hope to take this on the road to be able to do that. Can I go again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, I'm from Milwaukee, which is not too far from Chicago. No. And there are a lot of um, you know, blighted communities yeah. in the Milwaukee area. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is there a way to change a neighborhood from the inside out? And is anybody doing any work on that, where we you know, actually go in and buy and place people in a community and then build neighborhood around the community to change the community longer term? Right. This is a point I remember my colleague Steve Rodenbush has talked about this sort of initiative and the extent to which we, we don't really do that so much. There's a uh, program called Moving to Opportunity. I don't know if that's familiar to many of you. It existed in several cities in the US and it was meant to assess neighborhood effects, but what it did was it moved individuals from a low income neighborhood to a higher income neighborhood. Um, and so it didn't change the neighborhood, <laughs> it changed the location of the individual. And there were lots of reasons why that wasn't so effective, in part because people have done social networks, and so they went back to the places where they felt um, more connected. Some of the neighborhoods that they went to weren't very far away. There were lots of reasons why the experiment wasn't necessarily so effective, it seemed more effective for girls and boys, um, as an aside. but. Um, but we don't really have the form of work on a larger scale where you think about, let's say, randomizing a particular kind of intervention like a park structure and then seeing how people manage over time. It's a great point. Um, it's a question, uh, George Turner, about the question you have about what is place. At the beginning, you mentioned that I mean the place are nested and uh, overlapping. And I just wonder how you deal with that because it's quite a complex question in a way in analyzing all those, those social data. So uh, if you could give us a little bit more on that kind of side. Yeah, I mean, there is a particular kind of, I mentioned hierarchical linear modeling <laughs> earlier. There is a particular kind of approach to that that's sort of within the, the longitudinal component of the program that allows for this overlapping structure at level two. I, that's, I haven't done those analyses yet, and so I don't know sort of how robust that is. Um, but I feel like 
um, we have to be able to adapt those kinds of models. I mean, right now, again, as I mentioned, these nested models, which are really effective at getting at things that have clear distinctions, um, a classroom in a school, a school in a neighborhood, a neighborhood in a state, and that, that hierarchy is, one able, is able to manage from, from an inferential standpoint. This one is stickier, but apparently there are right, new mechanisms to deal with the overlapping nature in level two. Uh, Professor Cagney, uh, since you've been here uh, for a couple of days or a week or so, um, have you drawn any insights as to why Hong Kong's population uh, have one of the longest long longevity ratios in the world? Um, after all, this is a place with high pollution, um, crowded <laughs> living conditions. <laughs> so the neighborhood effect that you talk about, how does that apply to Hong Kong? Any insights on that one? Wow. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things um, I was, uh, we, well, we were meeting together with a social worker um, at the end of last week who suggested to us that people spend a lot of time living outdoors, that their social engagement, um, you know, it, the way he, he characterized it was, was slightly more negative in the sense that he said people don't invite others in. We were talking about this earlier too, that there isn't necessarily a comfort with bringing people into the space. He also felt like there was a little bit of self-presentation to it, that um, there was this sense that um, you almost wanted to keep your, your smaller space and maybe your solo space unknown to others. Um, but. But the flip side of that is that you're outside and you're engaging socially all of the time. And that has to, there's a lot of data to suggest in social network theory focused on older adult well-being that the more you socialize, the better off you are. The longer you live, um, the fewer chronic conditions you have. There's a lot of data on that. It's, it does seem to me like a very social culture. It also seems to have very strong family ties. Now, I don't know if that's biased by the fact that I was here right on Friday, and that's the night of your right, family-based holiday. But people talked about that a lot and the connections. Um, that also you know, has to be predictive, and other data indicate that it is. Um, but I have to think more carefully about your question. But what do you think? I always like turning these questions. But I also want to learn something while I'm here. I'm interested in what you think. Um, I live in Minnesota for many years, ah, yeah. and um, my mother lived there until she died, and she lived by herself. And, but being ethnic Chinese, Asian, she got to get out a lot, despite not having transportation. I mean, she couldn't drive anymore. Um, and there were a lot of people um, inviting her to go to places. So I think the socialized part you know, has a lot to do with that. And my observation since I've been back in Hong Kong is that I'm amazed at how many elderly people are on the streets. Yeah, you know, well, I go to the swimming pool, outside. six o'clock in the morning, it's all crowded because of older people, because they have a discount. <laughs> then I'm on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and I, mean, I, I sort of look forward to the day that I turn 65 because everything would be two dollars. I mean, two Hong Kong dollars, <laughs> 30 cents. Um, and they get to go out. So there seems to be a lot of, for whatever reason, they do socialize a lot more. Um, and this compares quite positively to Singapore. Mm. So I also lived in Singapore for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, um, the elderly are not seen as much you know, in, in Singapore. They seem to be taking care of the children so a lot more, rather than being outside, going hiking. Uh -huh. um, so, but I don't know, that's just observations. I was wondering if there's any uh, academic, you know, from everybody here, um, you know, academic research that has been done on why Hong Kong being one of the most polluted cities, it's often been cited, and yet, you know, there's one of the highest uh, longevity cities in the world. But, you know, it may be that all of those social components just buffer these other kinds of environmental effects. Yeah, please. So I would like to answer your question because once I 
heard from uh, an insurance company in Hong Kong, <laughs> and they said that Hong Kong is such a small city. So uh, if you have any accident or heart attack, you will be sent to the hospital in maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So this is the data, the data from, from the insurance company. Yeah, I heard about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That was helpful. Okay, um, I think we'll break at this point. I just wanted to say um, thank you again, yeah, Professor Kagi, for coming to Hong Kong and sharing your insights. And I have to say, we have to give her a really big uh, round of applause because she got off a plane on Thursday night um, from Chicago yeah. and was completely jet lagged and went to dinner straight from that. And I think we went until 9.30 <laughs> or 10. And it was the most uh, engaging dinner that I've had with anybody in a long time. It was several of us. Yeah. Um, she's a she, great, great dinner uh, guest and a really engaging conversationalist. And so many of these topics touch on so many areas of our lives. I think it's really important that we welcome you back. Thank you. Thank you very much.